I'm not suggesting that making the perfect loudspeaker is easy, but the barrier to entry may be a lot lower than any of us thought. I have a lot to say about the Polk Audio Reserve R700, so let's get into it. The R700 is a beefy three-way tower speaker sporting a one-inch pinnacle ring radiator tweeter, a six-and-a-half-inch turbine cone mid-range, and two, yes, two, eight-inch bass drivers, much of which is carried over from Polk's costlier Legend series. Now, the speaker's four drivers and bottom-facing port combine for a reported frequency response of 38 hertz to 38 kilohertz, with a sensitivity of 88 dB and a minimum impedance of 3.6 ohms, meaning this large tower isn't necessarily impossible to drive though a competent amplifier will give you the best results. The R700, while big, is not overbearing. Up close and personal, you begin to appreciate some of the speaker's finer details, such as rounded corners and hardware disguising surrounds for each driver. Now, around back, you're going to find two pairs of high-end binding posts that help to facilitate by amping or, at a minimum, by wire connections. The one aspect of the R700's looks that I am not keen on are the feet. First, the feet are part of the speaker's design, so while I feel they could have been made to look better, you can't get rid of them altogether. That downward firing port business. However, aside from that minor complaint, I actually think that the R700, for as large as it is, is actually pretty classic in its appearance. Now about that white finish, I was surprised as many of you were to receive a pair in white. Because according to most websites, the R700 typically only shows up in walnut or black unlike just about any of the other reserved speakers, which are offered in white. But no matter the finish, setting up the R700 is pretty trouble-free. We found the R700 to be rather forgiving when it comes to placement, due in large part to its port design. I'm not suggesting that the 700 won't load or charge a room with bass if placed improperly. It will. But it will give you a little more wiggle room compared to other speakers we've reviewed. This means that in some rooms, you may even be able to get away with placing the 700s closer to your front wall without too many adverse effects. Now, I did find that a small amount of toe-in worked wonders in locking in the speaker's soundstage and center image, but aside from that, these are fairly forgiving speakers, arguably more so than their much smaller sibling, the R200. In terms of power, I would strongly recommend you come correct and feed these beasts a solid 100 watts or more if you can manage. Sure, they can be powered successfully with an AV receiver like the Marantz 8015 or even the Onkyo 7100, but they absolutely are at their best when given real power. So if your receiver has preamp outs, this would be a great opportunity to dive into separates for the 700s are the type of speaker that are going to reward such an investment. We tested ours with the Emotiva XPA HC1 monos, as well as the XTZ Edge A2400, and lastly, the Crown XLS Drive Core 2. Integrated amp pairings included the Marantz Model 40N, as well as the Rotel 1592 Mark II, with both doing a good job, though admittedly, I preferred the Rotel here, but overall the Marantz 8015 acting as a strict preamp feeding a pair of Emotiva monos was the standout synergistic match for me. As far as sound goes, I don't know how else to put this other than just to say it. Upon hitting play and listening to about a half a dozen tracks or so off my demo music playlist, I knew these speakers were special. Actually, I got the sense that I was listening to something more than just a little bit special. I was experiencing greatness. I'm going to break it down for you in just a moment, but I want you to remember one thing. The 700s retail for around two grand a pair. This is important because, for me, the 700s raised more philosophical questions than sonic ones. But let's get into it. On the whole, and when listening to music, be it electronica, courtesy of Moby, or harder driving rock a la Godsmack, the 700s almost complete lack of coloration or attenuation throughout its frequency response was apparent, even to these subjective ears. I wouldn't say that the R700 sounds different from what I recall that of the R200s, but it is far more of a complete speaker in that the bass extends to near full range territory, which matters when it comes to the recreation of scale and dynamics, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I grabbed my measuring tools, I scribbled in my notepad that the 700s were among, if not the most neutral speaker we have had in this house to date. A quick sweep from 20 to 20 in Rumi Q Wizard confirmed my hunch. The 700s in-room response is stupid good. 
But a loudspeaker's performance is way more than its mere frequency response. And I am aware that neutrality isn't going to be everyone's cup of tea. I know it hasn't historically been mine. In terms of bass, the 700 played down low enough that for some, no subwoofer is going to be required. In fact, I never thought to even plug ours in during our evaluation. In our room, I saw solid extension down and around 30 hertz and even a bit lower, albeit with some roll off. There is a bit of injected bass energy around the 80 hertz region, at least from what I could hear and later see, but nothing too aggressive as to make the speaker sound, well, sloppy or boomy. If anything, when driven by the Emotiva amplifiers, the 700 possessed some of the deepest and also some of the most detailed bass I've heard in a long while, and arguably some of the best that I've heard from a speaker retailing for around two grand. Feed them a diet of quality power, the R700's bass is great, even at lower volume, something I discovered during a late night marathon listening session after Christy went to bed. I don't typically find that I enjoy bands like Rage Against the Machine at volumes below, say, 60 dB, but I sure as hell did through the R700s. If anything, I want walked away from the experience with a newfound respect for all of the intricacies and nuances that I feel get overlooked in their recordings. So mad props to the R700 and its bass performance. Moving up to the mid-range, well, there is just absolutely nothing to alert you to here. If you value neutrality, accuracy of tone, and just a general lack of color or overt character, the 700 is arguably as good as, and maybe even better than the Revel M16. So don't worry about the speaker changing any of the inherent timbre of instruments or vocals because it doesn't. There is no cabinet coloration or boxy resonances either, at least none that I heard. The 700s have some of the most natural, present, and detailed mids you're likely to come across this side of spending silly money. The speaker's ring tweeter ranks among my current favorites. I loved it in the R200 and I adore it here. Polk has done a great job towing that fine line between knowing when to push the highs and when to back off. As a result, the R700 has a bit more presence up top compared to the recently reviewed RP600M Mark IIs from Klipsch, though it never encroaches upon fatiguing territory. The roll-off is so utterly smooth that you'll experience the sensation of bright, airy highs, but without the punishing glare, or worse, fatigue, that often follows. It's brilliant. Even recordings such as Alanis Morissette or Nirvana's MTV Live albums, which are known for possessing a little bit of sibilance throughout, never became punishing. This is a tweeter that pairs very well with a wide range of genres, and it is also one that gives recordings a sense of detail without ever sounding forward or artificial. Now this being a large speaker, the 700 soundstage is transformative. The speaker has terrific width and height with excellent separation and detail. With a bit of toe in, center imaging is fantastic. Lead singers appear out of nowhere with near lifelike scale and body. The detail retrieval between the speakers is so good that subtle cues such as an artist, you know, swaying behind the mic is easily discernible. Dynamics, they are equally impressive, though largely amplifier dependent. With a few hundred watts on tap, the 700 remains dynamically interesting at virtually all volumes, adding only visceral impact and, well, the sense of weight as you turn things up. But when driven by an AVR like the Onkyo 7100, it can sometimes take a bit of volume to get the Polks to wake up. But get the mixture just right and the 700s will leave you wanting for nothing. When it comes to comparisons, the most obvious is the hugely popular Klipsch RP8000F, which just received an update in the Mark II, which sadly I have not heard yet. Sticking with the original though, the 700 is technically better. Now I say technically because you may prefer the more dynamic, lively, and punchy sound of the 8000F to that of the far more neutral and composed R700. I can't make the call for you, nor would I fault you if you were one to prefer the Klipsch, especially for home theater use, but based on my subjective and objective observations. If you were to ask me which of these two speakers is the better all around performer for any and all types of music and movies, I'm picking the R700. I didn't even have to think about it. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, about the R700's performance that I have to explain. It's just good. 
Other notable comparisons include the Monitor Audio Silver 500G 7G, which will run you a bit more compared to the R700, though I believe the Monitor Audios to be the better looking speaker, especially in their new ash finish. Looks aside, the R700 is every bit the 500's equal and quite possibly its superior, possessing a more present and fleshed out mid-range and more linear based response due to its port design. And for that, I could see the Polk being the better fit for more rooms despite its larger size. I prefer the R700 to the KLH Model 5, as great as I think the 5 to be. While the vintage styling of the 5 does hit a chord with me, I like the more unified look of the R700 to that of the KLH. In a head-to-head, -head, the 5 comes across as more forward and lean in the mid-range, not to suggest that the Polk is somehow super warm. It isn't. Now, the 5s have a spot of character, whereas the Polks are more just the facts, ma'am. I'm so excited by these speakers, I think they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with far costlier speakers like the Wharfdale Elysian, which we just got in-house, so stay tuned for that. Speaking of speakers that cost more, compared to the Bowers & Wilkins 702 Signature, as gorgeous as that speaker is, the Polk sounds more true, more accurate. The BMW has loads of detail and can be impressive in its own right, but the Polk isn't as fussy when it comes to power and placement, nor does it ever wander into punishing territory with respect to the tweeter. Which brings me to the conclusion and the philosophical hi-fi questions I spoke about earlier. Now, I am not a measurements above all else kind of guy, not saying that I don't know how or that I don't understand speaker measurements. I just simply never let them dictate how I feel about a speaker. And if you watch this channel regularly, you know that tracks. <laughs> That said, the R700 from Polk is just one of those speakers that subjectively captivated me from the get-go. I listened for hours, night after night, marveling at their delicacy and nuance, only to be more impressed when taking things to 11. Even in my subjective sessions, I knew that I was hearing greatness. The R700 is capable of truly reference-grade performance, even if put up against some of the all-time greats. This is a speaker that will not be so easily embarrassed. So I will ask you the same question I'm asking myself. Should I spend more on a speaker? And if so, what am I really trying to achieve in doing so? So that's it. That is now my review of the Polk Audio R700 Tower speakers. But before we sign off, I wonder what Christy thought. Well, before I get into what I think about the speakers, mm -hmm. I want to address what you said at the very end. And give you my thoughts okay i'll tell you what i think you're trying to achieve mm -hmm. by thinking that you need to spend more okay what 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 are, we, what are you trying to achieve what Suspect. you're trying to, what i'm trying yeah to what achieve. i oh, think oh what oh. i think you're trying to achieve oh okay okay what am i trying to achieve validation Huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and for someone that preaches that the only person that has to like the sound of their system is you, mm. I have to ask you, why do you care so much? <laughs> <laughs> she cuts deep. Um, honestly, I don't have the first f***ing idea. Really? I don't. I think on some level, there are some things in this community, there are some things in this hobby, in this business that I would like to bring to the channel, that I would like to expose you all to, if for no other reason than to be able to live vicariously through these videos and our experience. And sadly, um, there's just some things that companies won't entertain or won't do or send us because we so often will talk about a speaker like the R700 as being as good as it gets or as good as you need to necessarily, you know, get. Because it's true. <clears throat> Excuse me. It It's true. The R700 is that good. Um, we have costlier speakers in this house. And while there are aspects of their performance, and I'm talking small aspects of their performance. And in most cases, it really is more finish and build quality that are better than the R700, but in head to head, nothing has embarrassed them. I mean, nothing, 
absolutely nothing at any price. Um, and you'll hear about these speakers coming up. But getting back to your question, um, I think that on a personal level, on a personal level, um, having been in this business as long as I have, been around the block as much as I have, the fact that there are things that we are now, that are now held against us um, because of the type of equipment that we often advocate for, um, it, it, it sucks. It really sucks. And so, yeah, there is a part of me that wants to have not only our 700s, but something quote unquote higher end enough that gets people's attention so that if no other reason, we can broaden the scope of some of the things that we talk about with all of you. But, um, do I personally need more than the R700? No. Yeah, I don't think you do either. And I know that you've been struggling with this a little bit lately. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, lar the larger the channel gets, obviously you want to expand and grow as far as what you're able to bring to viewers and, mm -hmm. and for yourself too. I mean, this is a job, but you know, you, you want to continue to be able to be surprised by products. Yeah. Um, and I know that you, it's something that you feel like a personal obligation or something. Mm -hmm. Um, the unfortunate reality of this particular industry is that I'm not so sure it would matter. You know, like even if we were to bring the best, whatever, you know, audiophile gold mm -hmm. exists out there to, you know, in this house, mm -hmm. I don't know that would really change hearts and minds of people that have already made decisions about who you are, who yeah. we are, and, you know, what this channel is about, which is really unfortunate. And yeah. that just continues to speak to the gate gatekeeping that I, that I see as, um, un unfortunately prevalent in this particular corner of the world. Yeah. I think it's sad to me mm -hmm. because if, you know, not, not trying to toot our own horn or anything, but like <laughs> this, our, our channel is, I believe the largest in this particular specialty AV space yeah. in hi-fi home theater. Mm -hmm. Um, and if we have difficulty being taken seriously, imagine how the average consumer feels. Yeah. And I think that that is the bigger problem. I still don't understand. And as a bit of an outsider, when it comes to hi-fi and home theater, mm -hmm. why you would want to try and limit who you can reach yeah. makes no sense to me fiscally. And also just as an industry, if you're wanting to grow and, mm. and reach new people, I, I don't get that. It's the same re It's the same thing that you're about when, when people say they've walked into a retail store or a dealer or whatever, mm -hmm. and <laughs> pretty woman moment yeah. with Julia Roberts, when she walks into that store on Rodeo drive and she's not taken seriously because she doesn't look like she has the money. Yeah. Well, you, you don't know shit if someone has the money or if they're going to understand it and, or, or not, you yeah. know, I mean, you, you should take the opportunity. I would hope to, um, potentially if nothing else, make a sale, uh, you know, or, yeah. or reach, reach new, uh, reach new audience. But I, I hate that you feel, um, the same pressure that the, viewers that we see in our comments are feeling because mm -hmm. you know if they go they they tell us all the time like hey you know i've I, if i go to some particular forum they made fun of me because yeah. you know my equipment wasn't you know didn't meet some particular standard yeah and the reality is in today's uh market i think that there are a lot of really really solid performing products that don't have a high end price tag. And I think it scares people in the high end space. Oh, if I was a speaker manufacturer right now of any persuasion, knowing that the R 700 exists, gives me pause. And I don't know how else to just come out and say it. Then it's just, it's that level of good. Oh, I agree. I think they're, I was super impressed with them. Oh and, my God. And what they've managed to do at this price point. Yeah. I've heard more than a few 
more than a few speakers that are far more expensive that don't sound anywhere near as good as these do. Yeah. And I mean, not unless you put, you know, a $10,000 amplifier or something on them. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm over that whole excuse. Mm -hmm. Like the people that are, that again, it's back to the gatekeeping. It's Mm -hmm. like, well, what are you running? You know? Well, why don't you let me worry about that and you worry about how your product performs? Oh, no, 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 no. Hold on. They're providing you with excellent customer service. Bull <laughs> <laughs> I set her up for that one. I knew I knew that response was coming. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. And, and if I can kind of make a comment, go rewind the tape a little bit um, about the dealer experience and the gatekeeping and whatnot, only in hi-fi. And this is true. Only in hi-fi have I, me personally, have I ever experienced gatekeeping. As a 26-year-old, I'm not trying to brag, but I am trying to illustrate a point. As a 26, 27-year-old, I was doing very well for myself in my first career to the point where I was legitimately on the market for a Ferrari. And I went to several Ferrari dealerships and never once, never once, was I denied a test drive? Was I denied answers to my questions? <laughs> no, only Kia does that. <laughs> yeah. Was I was I anything? And 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 we worked many deals. And I was a totally qualified buyer. Even at my position as the editor of a magazine once upon a time, having this YouTube channel, being recognized even in stores or in uh, dealer showrooms or at trade shows wearing, you know, badge, like who I am. Um, I've literally been asked to leave certain brands' rooms. I have been not waited on at a hi-fi store. Cash in hand, money burning a hole in my pocket. I came here because you had X and I was ready to buy and got zero service. Probably because I was also a 27, 28 year old kid wearing jeans and a t-shirt. So gatekeeping is real. I've experienced it at every level, but I've only really experienced it when it comes to consumer goods. I've really only ever experienced it in hi-fi and it makes no sense to me. No sense to me. You know, as a woman, there's... I can't, unfortunately, I, I could say I've, I've experienced it outside of hi-fi, but, um, I hear what you're saying. And I just thought, um, it was an interesting way that you ended the review. And I know that you've been feeling internal pressure, you know, mm-hmm. that you've, you're putting on yourself, obviously mm-hmm. to, uh, elevate, always wanting to elevate your game. And mm-hmm. I just say, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I love you. Yeah. Uh, anyway, back to the speaker, <laughs> back to the speaker. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought it was really, it's a really, really, really good speaker. Um, I love the matte finish. Mm-hmm. The white is really modern and clean. Whether you're going to be able to find a pair in white. No idea. We were hoping to get some solid answers about that. It could have been a glitch, a, just a random act of uh, as far as us getting them in Shipping white. Shipping and logistics. I mean, you know, it, it's a unicorn. They are Bigfoot. Yeah. So <laughs> hopefully you can find a pair. I know a lot of you guys have been asking about them. Yeah. Uh, I like that they have a slender profile despite being a larger speaker. So yeah. they're not imposing. Yeah. Uh, my only critique as far as visuals go is the driver material. It kind of reminds me of a car tire. Oh, okay. That if you take the grills off, if you take the, I like the grills that, are beautiful. I love the grills. You're thinking of the mid range, that mid range that has the kind of dimple ripples in it, that yeah. turbine cone. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, different. It's, it's different. Not obviously. Sure, I'm sure there are going to people that that may be their favorite aspect of it. <laughs> but every time I see it, it reminds me uh, of a, a tire and. Yeah, 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 not not into that. Um, I thought they sounded great when we were watching movies, yeah. and there wasn't. And you kind of said this: there really wasn't a single song that we played on them that where they sounded ba- bad. Mm-hmm. So if you if your if your musical tastes run all genres, you should put these on your list. Yeah. Um, I think that now that I've heard both of 
both these and the Polk R200 bookshelves, mm. I would definitely get these. I would too. Uh, they, you know, you guys know that I'm really, really particular about base performance. Mm-hmm. And these did not disappoint me at all. Like I never felt they were sloppy or bloated down low. Mm-hmm. Um, the the base was fast and quick. Like I like it. I don't yeah. think you need a subwoofer. But just to kind of wrap things up, I I honestly don't see any reason why these can't, can't be a reference speaker. All right. Well, that is now our take on the Polk R700 tower speaker. Now it's time for you guys to tell us what you think. And while you're down there. My question of the day is what I ended this review with, and that is if you spend more on a loudspeaker than what the R700 commands, what are you looking to achieve? I really want to know. And please be honest. No judgments here, okay? I still want certain things even though I know they're probably not demonstrably better than what speaker we just talked about. You know what I mean? But I still want them. Anyway, now it's time for your turn. Let us know. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. Go ahead and ring that bell so that you're notified when new videos come out. If you use any of the links that Christy left for you down below, uh, you do thanks. Or you become a member to this channel. Know that all three of those ways are a great way that you guys have continued to show your support for this channel and the work that we do here. And both Christy and I thank you all very, very much for doing that. Follow me on Instagram at Recovering Audiophile. And that is it for us today. So remember... The only person who has to like the sound of your system is you. I'm going to take my own advice on this one. Um, So thank you for watching, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye.